everyone and welcome back to our channel. Isn't that right, baby? Yes. My name is Rachel. This is Kyra. We're going to talk about some books, aren't we? Bramble pig. Okay. Lisa Schwartz. She used to be kind of huge on YouTube and numbers wise, she kind of still is today. She's still got over 2 million subscribers, which is crazy. Numbers that people like me could never dream of, but her views are less high. They're more my range now, you know? I remember back in the day, I never really used to watch her content, but I do remember seeing a few of her videos pop up on my suggested feed, and I think I saw one or two here or there, but the thing she was most known for was when she was dating Shane Dawson. I'm kind of most aware of her because I've reviewed Shane's first book here on my channel in a big in-depth three-part review. You can go find that linked below if you wanna watch it. Um, there were a lot of mentions of her in there. They were a big part of each other's life. They were dating for a good few years, three, four years, something like that. However, I feel like over the last few years, basically since they broke up, a lot of people have kind of forgotten about Lisa. And in some ways I kind of feel a bit sorry for her because it meant she lost a big chunk of her audience, a big chunk of her views probably a big chunk of her revenue, but at the same time she also missed out on the kind of backlash from Shane's big cancellation. She wasn't really a part of that, despite being in this video, which was one of the big controversial ones. Real. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> we want to know. We have a question. What is it? Very important question. And you don't need to feel shy about it. Oh no, you really... <laughs> you it's really, natural. It's natural. Is there anybody around? No. It's natural for a girl at your age. Yeah. Do we want to talk to you? We want to explain what sex is to you. We did get yeah. real quiet. <laughs> Let me see, this happens. See, oh. <laughs> ah. And then, and then you're so happy when you're an adult. I can't believe I'm endorsing this. <laughs> I know she was also in some of Shane's more offensive films. She was in quite a lot of his videos. I'm not entirely sure how she managed to escape the wrath of the internet, but I think she pretty much has. I've not seen a lot of people angry at her. From what I do know though, the positive stuff she's done, again, just hasn't got a whole lot of attention because it just hasn't been that interesting. She doesn't seem that controversial one way or another. People don't really love her, they don't really hate her, she's just sort of there. And today her videos are this sort of inoffensive, bland, it's just there, you know? Videos like she talks about being an empath, last minute gift ideas, try on hauls, answering some questions. It's all fine, it's inoffensive, it's not a big deal, it's just personally not really my kind of content. And not really yours, is it baby? No. I also feel like her content is really stuck in the early days of YouTube and what people were watching back then. It hasn't really evolved since then. I just feel like maybe her content hasn't grown and evolved as YouTube has. So why am I talking about her today? Well. Turns out, while I was researching video ideas, I stumbled across a book that she wrote and published in 2019, strangely many years after the peak of her popularity. She writes this book titled 30 Life Crisis, Surviving My 30s, One Drunk Baby Shower at a Time. And as a woman who is turning 30 very soon, I thought now would be a really good time to read this book and review it on my channel. If you don't know, I review lots of YouTuber books here. Um, you can go check them out if you want, I've covered many people, some of who we don't talk about anymore. Very quick reminders before we start, if you're new here it would be wonderful if you subscribed. If you're not new here, maybe just check you're still subscribed please, that's always really helpful. If you want to find me on social media, you can follow me over on Instagram at Rachel Oates with a zero, or give me a follow over on Twitch for gaming and Lego and just chatting streams. They're very relaxed, very quiet, a lot of fun, I enjoy them. I also have Patreon merch, a poetry book that I've released on Amazon, and photography and art prints for sale if you want to help support my channel and my work and stuff like that. January is always a really tough time because ad revenue is right down and right now it's not even close to covering my rents so every little helps and thank you in advance. But for now, all that out of the way, back to Lisa's book. My first impressions of this were what the hell is this cover? Honestly, that's my biggest critique of this book. What is the cover? <laughs> Despite being an almost 30 year old woman who loves dogs and wine, None of this appeals to me. I would not pick up this book if I saw it in a shop and didn't know who Lisa was. I probably wouldn't pick this up if I knew who Lisa was and wasn't making a video, to be honest. The layout looks cheap. Nothing stands out. Lisa looks bored as hell on the cover. And I'm thinking, well, if she looks like this on the cover, then what's the inside of the book like? Doesn't really sell the book to me. But like a lot of Lisa's content, it's inoffensive but unappealing. 
you know? It's not something I'd feel excited about having on my shelf. And like I say, if I wasn't explicitly looking for YouTuber books to review on my channel, I probably wouldn't have even notice this existed. Now, the content of the book itself. This book opens with a foreword by Shane Dawson. So, you know, always good to start on a low, right? It can only get better from here. <laughs> I do get it though, and I understand why she chose to do this, because the peak of Lisa's career, career on YouTube was when she was dating Shane Dawson, and I'm pretty sure this book was written at the time when Shane was like peak popularity, he was getting millions and millions of views on every video, he had, what was it, something 20 million subscribers or something, I might be making that up. So getting him to write the foreword for her book, fantastic marketing decision for her and her team. Now. I feel like that's backfiring a bit, probably. <laughs> so let's read Shane's foreword, which is titled, The author of this book took my virginity, a foreword by Shane Dawson. This entire opening little essay that he wrote here, it wouldn't be out of place in his own books. It's definitely his writing style, it's definitely his voice. The title is like you'd see in his books, the content is like what you'd see in his books, and that's not a good thing. If you watch that series, you'll know what I mean. And if you did watch that series, let me know down in the comments, please. The thing is, while having Shane's name attached to this book might have been a smart marketing idea at the time, I don't know who the hell approved this actual content. It is disgusting, it is cringy, it is poorly written, and it is everything I hate in a book. It's Shane's typical be shocking and gross as a replacement for being funny, and I hate how he writes dialogue like he's writing a script without ever bothering to write complete sentences. I'm reading a book, it's not that hard to just give me some prose. Give me a he said, she said. You don't have to be this lazy. It doesn't add anything to the book, it just makes it harder to read, and it seems like, you know, low effort on your part. He did this throughout his whole book as well, and it really annoyed me the whole time. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry for everyone who has to hear this, but the book opens with Shane and Lisa in a warm apartment with no air conditioning, and Shane writes this revolting passage. Get the ear bleach ready after this, because you're gonna need it. It was a hot summer's night in the magical city of Hollywood, and an even hotter summer's night in the one-bedroom apartment of struggling actress Lisa Schwartz. This wasn't because the people inside were having heated, passionate sex, but because Lisa didn't want to pay for air conditioning, and would rather occasionally put her head in the freezer and her tits in the fridge. I watched her do this one night as I sat bottomless on the couch, with a large ice cube wedged in the top of my hairy ass crack. As I adjusted the towel underneath me to make sure I wasn't getting ice poop sweat drips on her couch, I thought to myself, tonight's the night, I'm going to lose my virginity. Like I'm sorry, but I don't think this is funny, I just think it's disgusting. Taking care of your personal hygiene keeping yourself clean, knowing how to wipe your bum, are basic little human things. It's not hard. And the fact that you're kind of gloating about not doing any of that isn't humorous. It's just horrible. And I feel so sorry for Lisa. And I feel like I can smell the room from this passage and I don't like it. I am very uncomfortable. He follows this up with his next description of Lisa, which is, Lisa sat down next to me, with the hardest nipples I've ever seen. Even harder than mine when I found out TLC was rebooting trading spaces with all the original designers coming back, before then going on to list her dialogue as she complained about not booking enough acting jobs because she's not young enough or thin enough. I get self-deprecating humour and stuff, but if I ask someone to write a foreword to my book and they spent the first two pages talking about nothing but my career failures and what my body looked like, I would be upset. It feels a bit gross. I feel like there's more to Lisa than that, and this isn't a nice or good or well-rounded introduction. It feels a little bordering on objectifying, you know? Like, if the only thing you can really say about someone's entire career and your relationship with them was, or the main thing you can say is, they took my virginity, you're kind of making it all about yourself, aren't you? It wasn't even her virginity, it was just his. Although, 
I'll talk about this in other videos, I hate this idea of taking virginity. Anyway, not the point. Then he tries to make up for basically insulting her a lot with whatever this is. As Lisa rotated the thawed part of the Tito's bottle away from her now purple vagina, I looked into her eyes and saw something she always seemed to have lingering in there uncertainty. She was constantly battling voices inside her head that were screaming that she wasn't good enough, pretty enough, thin enough, talented enough, or most importantly, successful enough. It was something that would send me into a whirlwind of confusion, because I didn't understand how someone so beautiful, so talented, so hilarious, and most importantly, so good, could be so hard on themselves. First things first, nice to see he's got some compliments in there that don't revolve around her nipples. That is good. Two, probably the most important thing here, can we stop getting vagina and vulva mixed up, please? They are different things. I'm pretty sure this cold bottle wasn't shoved inside her vagina. If she was trying to cool herself down by putting it between her legs, maybe it was touching her vulva, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't shoved inside her vagina. Just, just saying. Um, and three, I get that he's trying to be like, oh, she's so great, but she's so uncertain about herself and I just don't know why. And I know that she's a real person and these are real experiences that we're talking about, but this just feels so cliched and old and overdone and how like it's meant to be like, oh, Lisa was not like the other girls. She was so beautiful, but she didn't know it. She was so smart, but she didn't know it. She was uncertain about herself, but I don't know why, because she was the best person I've ever known. And it feels very cliched, and I'm like, I've read this 10 times before, and I was bored of it then, and I'm bored of it now. Give me something new. Give me a reason to read this book make her interesting. Sh Shane then goes on, he keeps talking about how he asked Lisa if she wanted to have sex, and then the whole thing is very Shane-focused, you know? I thought this of Lisa. I'd wanted to wait until marriage because of my religious beliefs. I have a small penis. I was worried about this and this and this and so on. It's all very Shane-focused. Not much about Lisa, or if this was a big deal for her, or what she really felt about it, or anything like that. He says he won't get graphic about their first time, th but then, proceeds to tell us, my ass sweat soaked through all her bed sheets and caused her mattress to mold. There's nothing more romantic than having your girlfriend ask if you peed the bed or if it was just a puddle from your back fat and ass sweat. I wish I could bleach my eyes from having read that. And now I've said it out loud, kind of want to bleach my tongue as well. Again, don't find this funny, just disgusting. Anyway, what's the point of this whole story about Shane losing his virginity? Oh, to, to Lisa, that was it, yeah. Um, but what's the point? It's for Shane to say, this book isn't just written by a funny woman with stories to tell. This book is written by a woman whose stories are worth telling. I'm so proud to introduce this book to you, written by a woman who is hilarious, dark, wise, insightful, and has always been good enough. Lisa Schwartz. Great, wonderful, thanks. I could have gone my whole life without reading that foreword, and I kind of wish I had. Now, on to Lisa's main book, and Honestly, everything is better than that introduction. Everything is better than that foreword. I know it's a low bar, it's not difficult, but it is. I have to say that now. This is by far not the worst YouTuber book I've ever read. Shane's was much worse. Certain poetry books were much worse. Jake Paul's was much worse. But there are a few parts that I just don't like about this, I don't enjoy, I do have problems with, and some bits that I actually think are okay, fine, I don't mind. On the whole, I just kind of didn't relate to the book as much as I thought I would. Like, writing this, Lisa was a single 30-year-old woman without kids and a dog who loves wine. I'm like, that could be me. I'm not single anymore, but I was for a long time. I was like, that could be me. I feel like I should relate to this, but I didn't at all, and we'll get into the details why as we go on. So, let's start with her introduction to the book, Raised on Seinfeld, in which she, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I've never seen it, I've never heard it said out loud, I'm just hoping it's right, in which Lisa opens by telling us, entering your 30s sucks. Okay, that was dramatic. Not everything about it sucks. You're finally in charge of your own life and you can do all the things your parents told you not to do, like have popcorn and wine for dinner or stay up for hours watching shitty reality TV shows while ordering useless products on Amazon Prime. And then she proceeds to complain about a shower head she bought. I get she wants to be kind of funny and relatable, but honestly, I think she could do better for the introduction to a book. It doesn't really hook you, it's not really anything new. I found it kind of boring, you know? But it really does set the tone for the rest of the book. Lots of complaining, lots of hyperbole, lots of stating quite mundane things and trying to pass it off as humour. Again, there's not really a lot to it. 
She then does get a little bit more introspective about turning 30, and while I'm sure this is something a lot of people can relate to, it isn't something I personally could. So I think this is more of like a personal gripe than a, oh, and this is why you shouldn't read the book. This is more of a, yeah, just not for me kind of thing. The minute you turn 30, everything starts to change. The bills on your desk get higher, your metabolism gets slower, and your friends get married and have babies. Now don't get me wrong, I love my friends, I want the best for them, including a wedding with an open bar and little humans I can give back when they start to cry. However, these sudden surges of change set my brain, sent my brain into a marathon of questioning. If they're settling down and having kids, am I supposed to? Do I want to? If I do, do I have to do it now? I feel like this wasn't something that happened to me when I hit 30. The whole questioning, what do I want to do with my life? Do I want marriage and kids thing? No. This was something I'd been thinking about for a long time before I hit 30. And I'd also got to a point, again, I'm 30 in a couple of months. I'm not actually 30 yet, but I feel like before I met my partner, like how many months ago now, um, I was at a point where I was very happy being alone. I'd kind of made peace with that. I was like, yeah, this is fine. And because I've kind of picked my friends carefully to be the same sort of people who have the same sort of values to me, I don't have this issue of everyone getting married and having kids. The people around me just aren't doing that. They're very much like me. They're quite career focused. They're dating and moving in with people and stuff, but not in a it's changing anything kind of way. So again, I can understand that this would be relatable, relatable for some people. But for me, I was like, okay, this is like the opposite of where my life is at as I approach 30. And maybe that's why I'm not in this panic, maybe that's why I'm not thinking it sucks, but yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. It's nice to see other people's opinions and perspectives though, I guess. It's good to get outside of your own head a bit, isn't it? Anyway, then she goes on to complain that her being unsure of her life choices leads her to destructive behaviour, and this is a pattern you see a lot throughout the book. She talks about really, really destructive and dangerous behaviour and passes it off like a joke, like, ha ha ha, isn't it so funny that I did this? And you're left thinking, oh god, are you okay? This thought cycle usually leads to a period of binge drinking and sleeping with random dudes as a fuck you to living life the right way, followed by a sub-session with a therapist who I'm sure, who I'm certain counts the minutes till we're done, topped off by a plate of fries and a side of, I should try to be like everyone else, right? Shit, I'm exhausted and we've only just begun. Welcome to your thirties. Like I obviously don't wanna shame anyone's personal life choices and stuff. And I'm always big on stressing in my videos that you know, there's no real timeline for stuff. Y it's never too late to make new friends, start a new career, learn a new skill, pick up a new hobby, all of that stuff. But what Lisa describes here as like being what happens when you turn 30 reads more to me as I have severe and untreated mental health problems and other trauma that I need to get over, not a 30 thing, you know? Like I say, I don't find this humorously relatable. I find this, oh my God, I'm worried about this woman. Is she okay? I'm all for people having a drink every now and again and getting a little bit drunk. But if you're drinking to kind of hide or cover up the fact that you're sad or struggling with something, that's probably not a healthy sign. I'm all for supporting people who want to have casual sex or multiple partners, but if you're using sex as a way of being like, oh, I'm sad and worried about this thing in my life and I'm trying to use sex as some sort of revenge tool or way to cover up how I'm feeling about it, like that sort of thing. If you're not having sex because you enjoy sex and because you're trying to like, you know, hide some sort of trauma or worries or if it's a revenge, then like that, that doesn't seem healthy. Does that make sense? That's the difference there. The worrying thing are her motives for the dangerous behaviors. And it's the motives that make it dangerous, you know, not the act of having a drink or having sex. That's not the bit I'm judging. It's the motives that make me worry about her. Is that clear? But she says, <laughs> don't freak out. I promise it gets better. Maybe a little too late, but okay. <laughs> If you've ever experienced the feeling of your age wearing you down or felt like you were on a diff different path than the people around you, I got your back. It took me 35 years to accept the fact I can't do life like everyone else, even if it would be easy for me to just climb the corporate ladder, settle down and pop out a kid or two. Every other moron is capable of doing it, why can't I? The answer? Seinfeld. Again, I had like mixed feelings about this because on the one hand I was like, great, I relate to not doing things the traditional way like everyone else, but I don't feel like climbing the corporate ladder and popping out some babies would be the easier option. That sounds like a horrific, horrible option that I know wouldn't suit me. Um, and I also feel like it's weird to like blame it on saying like, oh, well, I don't wanna do this because 
TV taught me when I was a kid. Weirdly oversimplistic. Well, I mean, she does. She does admit that it's oversimplistic. She says, um, yeah, basically she goes on to say she's basing her life now off Seinfeld subconsciously because the four main characters were single, independent misfits in their 30s. They lived alone, overthought everything, and made love look tedious. Seinfeld laid my life out before me. I just didn't know it yet. Again, maybe it's because I don't really know what Seinfeld is, but this feels overly simplistic which she does kind of admit, like I say, she says, of course the TV show can't be the only explanation for an aversion to the norm. Personally, I like to blame my parents. That's what they're for, right? The reality is mine are actually delightful humans, but they're just that, human. Without knowing it, their innate fears and overt neuroses rubbed off on me at a very young age. She says she's writing this book for those of us who have had to parent a parent unprepared as they lay sobbing in your arms. The ones who have finally accepted they need help because leaving the house has become increasingly more difficult. The ones who relate to being called crazy on a first date or who have had to explain to a grandparent time and time again why they're still single. Those are the ones who talk to their pets, dance to the music playing in their heads, and can't wait to get home to rip off their spanks. And especially the ones who are exhausted by the tears and are desperate for the giggles. Again, I found this a bit hard to relate to, so I'm thinking maybe I'm not actually the right person to be reading this book. I mean, I do struggle with leaving the house in winter. I've spoken about this before, but it's fine. I'm okay with it. I kind of made peace with that. And I do talk to Kyra a lot, but I don't think that's a weird or bad thing and not something I need to necessarily read a book about. Anyway, the rest of it, nah, not for me. But then she warns that, finally, a warning. This book will be unfiltered and often unladylike. It has to be. It's real. It's funny at times, sad at others, and humiliating, to say the least. I'm not holding back, because humans need to know that other humans are just as fucked up as they are, and that's okay. So again, maybe this book isn't for me, but I think there's a difference between, like, being unladylike and unfiltered and being honest and real and what Lisa does, which is, like, describing how she poops at random intervals. Random intervals in the book, not in her life. No, her poops are very scheduled, apparently. Didn't need to know this. So like I say, probably just not for me. Like many of the references in this book, the first chapter's title and subject seems a little outdated f to me. It's titled Gender Reveal Party. Yes, it's a fucking thing. And I get that gender reveal parties are a bit stupid. They seem like a silly idea to me. And I think it's way more of an American thing than it is in the UK. But I feel like even back in 2019, they were kind of old news. You didn't have to be like, yeah, can you believe that's a thing? Because everyone was kind of doing them already. Maybe you could have been shocked about them in like, what, 2014, 15, 16, but by 2019 they were like a pretty solid thing, so I felt like even then this reference was outdated, now incredibly. But she opens the chapter by talking about getting a dog as a kid and how that somehow relates to her having a lot of panic attacks when she hits 30 because she couldn't deal with all her friends having kids. There's a link there somewhere. Her and her best friends get invited to a bunch of baby showers. When we entered our 30s, we started co to collectively feel the changes around us. With every baby shower invite, we held onto each other a little tighter. We also started drinking a little heavier. As our friends started getting pregnant and our so social circle started changing, we noticed that we were no longer the centre of the party. In fact, we were the annoying girls that needed to put down the champagne and invest in a cardigan set. We knew it, but we weren't about to do it. Instead, we would sit in the back of the room at every baby shower and roll our eyes as we pounded the drinks we'd snuck in. We weren't ready. Again, I don't really know how I'm supposed to feel about this. Like, am I meant to pity them? Am I meant to find them annoying? Am I meant to tell them to grow up? Am I meant to congratulate them on doing their own thing? I don't know what tone she's going for. I don't know what message she's trying to put out there. I find it very confusing. Then there's a whole rant about present buying and loose vaginas, and I'm like, okay. This part I did find funny though. She gets invited to a specific gender reveal party and she says, as if the two baby showers we'd attended for the fetus wasn't enough, we had to pretend to care whether it was coming out with a penis or vagina. Let me tell you, there are very few things I actually care about. Teeny tiny private parts are certainly not one of them. I did find that quite funny and I do think she has a point. The whole like, ooh, this is the sex of the baby thing. Why do you need a party for that? It is very weird. So I did, I had a little <laughs> at that, which not many parts of the book made me <laughs> But that was the closest I came to a proper laugh, so good on her. 
There's lots of stuff in here about feeling uncomfortable around pregnant people and kids and all that stuff and I get it. It's why I don't really have family focused people in my life, it's not my scene, it's not my thing. So I relate to her being grossed out by like kids being all snotty and dirty and gross and screamy. I get that. But it feels like when she's uncomfortable, Lisa's response to everything is just to drink a lot of alcohol. And it's written, like I say, in a way that's meant to be funny, but it just comes across as concerning. Using alcohol to deal with your issues like this, not a healthy thing to do, made me concerned. Like, I like a glass of wine as much as anyone else. I love getting tipsy and having a bad dance in a bar every couple of months. But I feel like once you start using alcohol as a crutch to deal with uncomfortable situations, that's a bad sign. I don't think that's a punchline to a joke, that's a cause for concern. Like, it just keeps going, throughout the entire book you see it, but in this chapter alone you get stuff like, my eyes finally focused on the most stunning sight I'd ever seen, a fully stocked bar. Randy, Jess and I raced to the bar. We, we filled our unusually large cups, unusually high, with unusually disproportionate amounts of vodka, and downed them at an unusually fast pace. Okay, that last part was a lie. We pretty much always drink vodka at the speed of light, but finally, ah, that sweet booze relief. Just like that, the colour in our cheeks, warmth in our hearts, and numbness in our heads, we finally felt we could conquer this absurd gender reveal celebration. Doesn't feel healthy. And then this story ends with Lisa getting very drunk, writing about how awful kids are, having a panic attack, literally running away from the party in the middle of it, and then her best friend telling her she's pregnant. And oh, look at that, when her best friend pr is pregnant, everything changes for Lisa. There's this whole section of Lisa worrying that things are changing too much now her friend's pregnant, but then it all ends in the most like gross, cliched, oh my god, but this baby was different, it was perfect, I fell in love with them immediately kind of thing. And personally, I hate it, I don't relate to it at all, and I'm sick of people telling me, oh, it's different when it's so this person's child or this person's child or this person's child. I'm like, no. Everyone tells me it'll be different with the next one. And every time a baby comes along in my life, I'm like, I really still don't care. Lisa decides to lean into this whole stereotype of like, oh my god, you're right, it's so different when it's so-and-so's. I held him and fell instantly in love. And with that love came an all new phase of our friendship. Suddenly our nights out turned into the most fun nights in, watching the little man grow and learn. Do not relate at all, do not like, hate this, sorry, this annoyed me. Again, more of a personal thing here, but the moral of the story is apparently, change is scary and hard and brain jiggling, change is also beautiful and exciting and elevating, but also, opt out of the popular route or the group you chose because you were afraid of not fitting in, look for the friends with heart and loyalty, humour and honesty, and willingness to communicate and grow, you don't say. It's all just very cliched and samey and I feel like I've read the same book ten times before, Give me something new. Give me something interesting. This is all boring. This is all perpetuating a lot of harmful stereotypes about women without kids and women in general and it just mm, doesn't do it for me. The next chapter is all about dating and online dating experiences and Lisa opens with complaining about a man ghosting her and she's like, oh my god, aren't men awful? But by the way, I've also been awful to men because I dated this one guy for a while so he'd do some DIY around my house and then I dumped him. Ha ha ha, relatable, right? We've all done it. No, it's not and we haven't. <laughs> That bit kind of annoyed me a little bit because again, I feel like it's playing into these sort of harmful stereotypes of women being shallow and materialistic and using men and stuff like that and it just kind of, uh, it gives misogynists fuel that they don't need, you know? But then she goes on to tell some more dating stories and you know, like she's had this bad experience and this one and these are fine. I think we have all, all had similar situations and I don't really have too much to complain about this. Just one of those things, okay. Again, not really anything particularly interesting, but not bad or offensive either. Some bits of the book are just plain bad though, and these bits really annoyed me and grossed me out. Chapter three starts fine, with Lisa talking about not being cut out for an office job, and how she wanted to get into acting instead. Absolutely fine, not a problem. And then out of absolutely nowhere, she has a several paragraph long rant about how and why and when she goes number two. I do not need to know about anyone's toilet habits for any reason. This isn't you being real and open and honest and it's gross for the sake of it and I don't wanna read it. I don't need to know about anyone's poops. There is a poop obsession throughout this entire book though and it's really gross. Later she talks about nearly going for a clonic but canceling because she, and I quote, loves a good poop. And it's even more bizarre when later in the book she describes periods as ew, gross, again that's a quote, but she's fine with talking about how much she goes to the toilet. Make it make sense. Poops are fine, periods are gross. 
it's just a bit much for me. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't want to hear it. The next chapter focuses about body image, which funnily enough is something you find in pretty much every memoir or book of essays written by a woman. It's interesting because it's something that affects all women, but at the same time, I have to think, why do we as women feel the need to so often talk about our own body images and how we feel about our bodies? Like, you don't get that so often in men's memoirs and books and all that stuff. In some of them you do, but it's not a staple like it is in women's, and I kind of think, why is that? I think we all know why, but it's worth thinking about, you know? Anyway, I'm not sure how I feel about the stuff Lisa writes about in this book. My body personally, and I'm doing exactly what I was just complaining about, talking about my own body issues, but like, my body is something that I'm quite sensitive about because personally, I feel like I've had pretty much the same body type my entire life. I'm not one of these people who's ever fluctuated in weight or body size or anything like that. I've been pretty much the same my entire life. And because of that, I feel very comfortable in my body. I like my body because of that reason. The idea of aging and my body changing drastically is something which scares me because I'm worried about one day kind of looking down and my body not feeling like my own anymore. It not feeling like the body I've had for the last 30 years, you know? So up to this point in my life, my body hasn't gone through any big drastic changes. But Lisa says when you hit 30, it's inevitable. It will. Your body will change. Your body will become unrecognisable. It happens when you're 30. And she says this to try and be funny and relatable, but honestly she just makes me a bit scared. She says, why didn't I bother to realise that your body does in fact change once you say goodbye to your 20s? It's not that you immediately turn back into a pumpkin, which is quite literally what I looked like as a child, it just gets exponentially harder to get your body to do what you want it to do. Suddenly hairs start growing in places that were once smooth, lime begins to appear on your face and send you into a lotion buying panic, metabolism refuses to speed up in order to handle the bag of chips and salsa you stress ate the night before, your weight redistributes itself to places you never thought it could, Overnight your arms get thicker, your waistline expands, and extra junk magically gets added to your trunk. I don't know how to feel about this. I get being real and honest about your own feelings about your own body, but when you kind of speak about things happening universally to all bodies, that kind of bothers me a bit. Because I, I have this issue where like, one of the things I hate most personally is when I see stuff online talking about real bodies have this, and real bodies have this, and real women are this, and this, and this, and so on, and like, you know, this whole thing about real women have stretch marks, real women don't have tummies like this, real women do it like this, and then sometimes, like, if I don't have that stuff, I'm like, well, does this make me not a real woman? Does this make me weird? Does this make me abnormal? And so, when Lisa writes stuff about this, and she's like, this will happen to you at 13, this will happen to you, and this will happen to you, I'm like, well, this is freaking me out, because either it won't happen to me, and that means I'm not a real woman, or it will happen to me, and that means I won't recognise my own body. I won't necessarily feel like me anymore. So, there's just no winning, is there? <laughs> I think there's probably better ways to write about this stuff and make it more personal to yourself without it negatively affecting anyone else, you know? There's some bits like this next bit that feel a bit gross and body shamey and are just sort of fear-mongering-ish. Like, she, <laughs> she says, this isn't meant to make you feel bad for me or make you afraid of getting older. I just wish someone had told me the hashtag, it gets better, doesn't apply to the female body over 30. Can we just stop with this idea that women hit a wall at 30 and it's all downhill from there. I know so many women over 30 with the most incredible bodies and I'd hope to be one of them. I don't think this idea of like, oh, it's all downhill, everything is worse, ha ha ha. I don't, I don't think it's healthy or necessary, you know? I don't know. There is a lot of stuff in this chapter that's really scary to read about like, Lisa hating her own body, having been on, on diets since she was literally a little kid, um, describing herself as being unfairly chubby, working out obsessively but eating minimally, and still looking mega porky. Those are all her words. It just seems very unhealthy and full of a lot of self-hatred. There's a lot of stuff about her going to Weight Watchers as young as she possibly could, but then using food as an emotional crutch when she's older and when she's going through stuff. And then she follows it up with alcohol dependency jokes and about finishing off at least a bottle of wine every night and drinking when she's uncomfortable, all of which sound very unhealthy. Call me boring, but I don't really think these are things you should be joking about. Having dated an alcoholic, it's not funny. It's not 
a punchline to a joke. It's not normal to be consuming that much alcohol and using it as a crutch like that. I've seen the pain, I've seen the health issues. It just, it's all very uncomfortable to me. I don't find it funny. And then by the end of the chapter where there's meant to be some sort of like resolve or message or moral or whatever, she just ends it by saying that now she still eats and drinks as much as she wants, but exercises excessively to try and combat it and how she'll probably never ever ever really be happy with her body image unless she's wearing her overalls to cover up her tummy and other bits. I don't feel like it's the inspirational ending she thought it was. The next few chapters really aren't that bad actually. There's some stuff about mental health in there, there's some stuff about seeing a therapist, all fine. I can't help but think that some of the attempts at humour just come across as a bit crass and offensive rather than funny, but I'm aware this might just be a matter of taste more than anything else. Lines like, There have been multiple times when I've been on a dating app and have come across multiple guys with girls' names. No matter how cute they are, I can't do it. I can't date a guy named Lindsay or Ashley or Dana. I'm sorry, I can't. Maybe that makes me a shallow bitch, but a shallow bitch who doesn't have to call her lover by a woman's name. Or the one story in which she gets an Uber and I flashed a peace sign and told the driver I was gonna give him five stars. That was a total lie. He was only getting three from me. That dude drove so slowly and his car smelled like a gallon of Lysol had spilled in the truck. Drunk. I assumed it was on purpose to cover up the smell of a dead body. It's just not my taste, it's not stuff I really find funny. I think these could be perceived as a little offensive. It's weird because like I say, I feel like I'm exactly the kind of person this book should appeal to and it just doesn't. The next big chapter I wanna talk about is titled My Gay Boyfriend and from this alone, I knew it had to be the bit about Shane Dawson and probably the only reason most of the people who bought this book bought this book and also probably most of the reason why you guys watching this video decided to click on this video. <laughs> a few pages in, she decides to set the scene. The year was 2009 and I met the man who had changed my life forever. I just didn't know it at the time because he was kind of stinky and acted super weird around me. Meet Shane Dawson, my future ex-boyfriend who also likes boys. And you know, the more I read about Shane Dawson from his foreword in this book, from what Lisa says in this book, from his books, the more disgusted I am by him. I've said it before and I'll say it again, but I don't find bad personal hygiene funny. I think some people use bad personal hygiene as a personality trait and it shouldn't be. It's just, I find it disgusting. I don't like it, I don't enjoy it. I'm someone who, I've had my fair share of mental health problems and I do have days where like I can't get out of bed, I can't shower, I struggle to do things like brush my teeth sometimes and with the sensory issues I have with autism as well, brushing my teeth has been another thing that I really, really struggle with. But, but it's something I have to try and force myself to do and when I can't do it, I feel really, really disgusted with myself and really, really horrible. And I make sure if I'm gonna be around other people, you know, you have that basic level of hygiene. It's just what you do. I just don't think making jokes about, ha ha ha, he was so stinky, ha ha ha, my Bum's not clean, like Shane does and Lisa does about Shane. It just, no, I don't feel good about it. I feel grossed out. It makes me wanna go wash my hands. So Lisa talks about first meeting Shane while they were filming some stuff with the Fine Brothers and that's how she got into YouTube in the first place. And you can tell she was right in this before Shane's whole big cancellation because listen to this bit. I remember spending hours in their tiny apartment laughing hysterically as we made silly sketches that would later get millions of views. YouTube was a lot purer back then. Truly, the community was so kind and collaborative. Everyone was doing it because it was fun and it fueled their souls and no one was making millions or filming mindlessly in, in Suicide Forest. <laughs> yeah, the dig at Logan Paul in there, I get it. That was a bad thing to do. But look at the things her and Shane and others like them did back in the day. The blackface, the inappropriate sex jokes to children. That's not purer. Truth is, there's always been a mix of content on YouTube and YouTube, like any, I guess we can say there's a YouTube culture or society. The cult culture is probably the right word. YouTube culture is always changing and growing and evolving. Different things will be popular at different times. Different things are acceptable at different times. It kind of moves a bit faster on YouTube because it's all online and that's just the nature of things nowadays. But look at the 2016 period when Leafy was dominating everything. Now, if someone as big as him literally mocked uh, children and mentally ill people every day like he did, there would be a lot more uproar about it now than there was back then, you know? Things change and what's acceptable and popular changes. But to look back and say things were purer in 2009 just feels disingenuous. She's looking at this through a lens of nostalgia 
and not critically at what was actually going on. Does she really think it was purer or is she just overlooking all the horrible content that her and Shane put out? The offensive stuff, the racist stuff, the child endangerment stuff. You know? It is very interesting how she describes Shane and I wonder if she'd say the same things about him now in his post-cancellation era, era where the public are more aware of him as being kind of manipulative and money hungry and slightly predatory, you know? The thing is like, I, I was taken in by it for a while as well. I didn't know Shane back in the early days but I knew him at his like peak popularity days and I thought he seemed nice, I thought he seemed lovely, I thought his content was, oh he's just being silly, he's being funny. It's weird how your views of people change, you know? I, I do wonder how she'd describe him now, three or so years on, you know? God, nearly four years on, we're in 23 now. God, time flies. Okay, <clears throat> anyway, she says about Shane. He had his own channel and he was known as the king of YouTube. With millions of subscribers, he was at the top of his game. Hell, he created the game. The best part was he'd done it all on his own. The more I worked with him, the more I understood why. Shane is universally relatable. He has an undeniable energy that makes anyone he talks to feel like they're understood and cared for. He's pure magic. You can't learn this in acting class, folks, or buy it at Target, where you can buy pretty much everything. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff then about Shane suppressing, suppressing his sexuality and her feeling sorry for him because she kind of knew but didn't want to admit it to herself. There's lots of stuff about other people questioning their relationship, so I get that that must have been really hard on her. There's passages like, People always ask if I knew Shane liked boys. For the record, he identifies as bisexual. My gay boyfriend was just a better chapter title. He thought so too. Um, to be honest, yes, I did kind of know. I always had a feeling that he was at least bi-curious. On our first date, I noticed Shane would follow men with his eyes as they passed our table. He didn't do this to women, just men. This continued for a while until finally, until I finally had to say something. When I asked him about it, he told me it was because he was always looking at other men to see how his body compared to theirs. Thinking about it now, it hurts my heart. He was already expressing so many feelings and curiosities. Hearing someone doubt the image he was trying so hard to project must have been heartbreaking. I agree with her, it does sound horrible, it does sound difficult, but regardless of what your sexuality is and if you're bi or not, I just find checking out other people on a date really disrespectful. Like, that's not okay. I don't think being bi is an excuse for that at all. Like, you just, you don't do it, you know? Anyway, one thing that really stuck out to, stood out to me was this segment. Shane often compared himself to Michael Jackson, minus the alleged inappropriate behaviour and one glove look. Identifying with the superstar's childlike approach to life, Shane had a pretty rough childhood himself, coming from a, pure, a, a poor and abusive household. Except, now there have been allegations of Shane being inappropriate with children, so... You know, that was interesting. And um, you know, the videos of like Shane asking little kids to twerk for him on stream and like him asking them to send him like photos of body parts and stuff, like it's not on the same level as the Michael Jackson allegations, but it's something that I did find interesting and that there's kind of like a weird parallel there and he draws the uh, comparisons himself and stuff. I thought that was interesting. All that said though, she does write about the relationship that they had with fondness, but it also feels weirdly transactional and kind of jarring to read, you know? Passages like, Between the videos on both of our channels, our, our, our audience got to experience our first Valentine's Day together, the first time we said I love you, the day we moved in together, the moment we adopted our dog. Every intimate moment was documented and distributed. It wasn't like we were exploiting our relationship, although we both had a tendency to use clickbait titles like, My girlfriend is pregnant? with a picture of Shane holding my stomach and only later reveal that we'd just eaten too much and were having food babies. We were just intense workaholics who found it far easier and much more fun to work together. Again, it just kind of makes me feel a bit sorry for her because like, I, I don't think I'd be comfortable with my relationship being documented to that extent, you know? Like, I'll talk about some things publicly and whatever, but I wouldn't want the whole thing documented online, like the pressure, all the eyes on you constantly, the constant judgments, just kind of makes it feel a bit not quite real, doesn't it? Especially for like really intimate moments, like their first I love yous. To do that on camera, it just feels a bit, I don't know, scripted, disingenuous, unreal, inauthentic. Like I say, I do feel quite sorry for Lisa reading 
many parts of this book, but especially the parts with Shane, and especially when she talks about the end of their relationship and how they were struggling through the breakup privately. And on top of all that, um, they had the added stress of needing to announce it publicly at some point, especially with it being so tied to their careers. That must have been really awful. It must have been so difficult. And I do feel really bad for her. Uh, she writes, in the past, there had been other YouTube couples who'd gone through public breakups, and we'd watched as they were brutally ostracized. Most of the time, the community would side with the more popular of the two, and the other person would just fade away. That was terrifying for me. Shane was far more liked than I was. I couldn't help but stress over the fact that my YouTube career could end in conjunction with my relationship. I hated that I had to think like that. Not only was I trying to wrap my head around this drawn out breakup, but I was worried about my view count. It felt so shallow, but it was my, my reality and it was heartbreaking. This went on for almost a year. I don't think it's shallow to worry about having to pay your bills and your career at all. You don't want to lose them both at once, but when you have a career so tied to your relationship, yeah, of course that's going to be a worry. I do, do feel for her. And then she talks about how Shane completely sprung their breakup slash his coming out video on her. He just filmed it all without her. She thought this was something that they were gonna do together and tell people together, but he just filmed it all without her behind her back, uploaded it to 8 million people without telling her, despite a big chunk of it being about her and their relationship, and then told her two hours before it was gonna go live, and then just, yeah, that's it, had to do it myself. It feels like a bit of a douchey move, and I get the whole coming out thing was something he wanted to do by himself, but when you're talking so much about your relationship with another public figure, maybe at least ask their opinion on it, you know? It just, I felt very sorry for her reading this, and her response again to feeling so upset was to go and get very, very drunk. Again, pattern throughout this book. And then while watching the video drunk, she says, and oh my god, I, She's so nice about him, and I have thoughts. <laughs> he spoke with such honesty and bravery, mastering the art of telling the truth and spreading a message. He spoke warmly of me and our relationship, and my part in this life-changing moment. It was more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. I hung on to every word. As much as I wanted to be mad at him, all I felt was complete pride. I knew within seconds of watching that his bravery and honesty were going to change lives and help so many kids in similar situations. I had never loved him more than I did in that moment. It's such a change of tone from how she was speaking about it before. And I get people changing their mind and realizing things and being upset about stuff and then coming round and whatever, but I can't help but feel like, is she saying this because she still feels like she has to? Shane was such a big influence at the time. And even after the breakup, she did rely on him and his fans for her views, her career, her basic income. So of course, she's gonna publicly have had to have this front of, oh my God, yes, I support him so much no matter what he does and he's so brave and no matter how much he might have hurt me, oh, this is so beautiful and brave. She's gonna need to do that if she wants to keep making money. She can't just turn against him and be like, this was really douchey of him, how dare he? He really hurt me. So I don't know how genuine her sentiments are. I don't know, I don't know. And then the chapter ends with Lisa saying that people are calling her a hero, so there's that. Clearly there's support in Shane no matter what was good for her career for a while. And then there's the next few chapters, she goes on to throw out more stuff that I just didn't relate to, like, I went to seven weddings in one year. That's not an exaggeration of the dramatic effect, this is the reality. By the time you hit 30, everyone is already married or sending you a save the date to their upcoming wedding. If you didn't already feel insecure about being without a partner or a ring on that finger, wait till you get the third wedding with when the mother of the bride drunkenly corners you in the bathroom and tells you she feels bad for you because you aren't engaged yet. Yeah, again, don't really relate to this. The last wedding I went to was like six, seven years ago and it was my sister's and the one before that was like 12 years ago and that was my brother's. The next one I'll go to is also my sister's <laughs> in April, but this time she's marrying a wonderful woman. The whole weddings thing, it's not really something my friends do. It's not really something I've had to do. It's not something I relate to, again, doesn't quite feel as universal as Lisa's making it out to be. But she she does keep doing this. She keeps being like, oh, this is a universal thing. We all go through and we all hit 30. And in reality, it's like, nah, I'm not experiencing that at all. Like, marriage is ingrained in all of us from a very young age. According to the stories we grew up on, people meet, fall in love, get married, and live happily ever after. I just assumed this was what everyone was expected to, to do. Like brushing our teeth, graduating from high school, and not driving off a cliff. Again, I don't 
really agree. I think that maybe this has been ingrained in some people, but it's not necessarily true of all of us. I spoke about this in quite a bit more detail in my, it was one of the reviews of Girl Defines second book. And I think it's the first video I did on that called something like Girl Defines the Guide to Cis White Love. If you wanna hear more of my thoughts on marriage and the traditional aspect of it and stuff, feel free to go check that out. One of the last parts I wanna address though is a chapter in which Lisa addresses the pressures she, as a woman, faces when it comes to pregnancy and having kids and all that stuff. And I didn't hate this at first, but something made me annoyed afterwards. We'll get to it. She says, I'm not sure if I wanna have a baby. I don't really have an instinctive feeling one way or another. Thankfully, I don't have a partner eager to knock me up. One perk of being single. I do, however, have a voice inside my head crafted by the whispers of societal standards reminding me I'm getting kind of old for baby making. Again, not something I can relate to, I'm pretty secure in my not wanting babies and, and I'm actually enjoying aging towards infertility. But I get that this is something a lot of people do feel pressure about, so I understand her talking about it. She actually writes a little pros and cons list about having kids, the pro being someone to look after her when she's old and that's it, and the cons being numerous. They're a little hyperbolic, but they are grounded in truth and I found this quite funny and I had a little <laughs> at this part, you know? So the cons, being pregnant destroys your body. You're always tired. Not because you're out partying or doing something fun, simply because your baby wakes up crying every hour of the every hour on the hour. This continues until the baby is awake for the day and you feel like utter death. You never have sex with your significant other after you've had your baby. You're exhausted, don't have time, and you're embarrassed your vagina is now a large mess. Most importantly, and my biggest deterrent to having a baby, you don't love your dog anymore. Argue all you want, but the majority of women I know who loved their dog so much pre-baby could easily do without them post-baby. This is devastating and heartbreaking, and I refuse to accept it as my future. So you could argue, like I say, it's a little hyperbolic for comedic effect, but I see her points. And the dog thing is something that actually I have noticed and does upset me. So many people ignore or forget about or just give away their dogs after they have a baby and it upsets the hell out of me. It really, really bothers me. Look at Paul and Morgan. Soon as their kid were born, gave up their dog. And I find it disgusting. I judge Paul and Morgan for a lot of things. That is one of the biggest ones. It's something I don't think I'm ever, ever gonna understand. I don't get how you can love someone one minute and then the next be like, oh, never mind, I found someone new to love. Get rid of you. It's just, <sighs> can you imagine if a parent did that with like two kids? They have a new baby, so they just give away a toddler. My Kyra is part of my family. She's my little girl and I love her so much. And I can't imagine ever just getting a new member of the family and then being like, okay, don't love you anymore, bye. To me, it's not the species that matters, it's the person and how they're a part of the family. And Kyra's a person in my family who I love and she loves me and she relies on me. How can anyone have that in their family and then just abandon them when a new person comes along? Maybe just don't bring a new person in your family if you can't look after them alongside the family you already have. If you have to neglect or kill a member of your family in order to bring a new one in, in order to properly care for that new one, then maybe you aren't ready to have the new one. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe you should have planned better. It makes me angry as hell. And I know a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but I don't really care. And my mind is not gonna change on this. People who get rid of their dogs after having babies disgust me. That's one thing I'm not gonna change my mind on. Uh, one thing I do agree with Lisa on is when she writes this about her dog. A dog is a single woman's other half, ride or die, co-pilot and hairy guardian angel. My pup has been with me through some of the most private and emotional times and I swear that little beast understands. That's my coops too and I love her for it. She then tells the story of adopting her dog and this is horrifying to me. There's this whole thing where they go to a shelter and they visit it and it's a shelter where they just kill dogs who don't get adopted, which is horrific and disgusting. And they get there and the first thing they see is just a dead dog being wheeled through the place. And she describes the place as smelling of feces, bleach and heartbreak. This upset me quite a bit. I didn't like it. I thought it was horrible. I don't know how common this is in America, but if it is, I'm disgusted and repulsed. And it makes me very, very glad to be in the UK where things are generally a lot, lot better. Battersea, for example, where I adopted Kyra from, and I, run, I regularly give money to them and raise money for them and stuff like that. They're wonderful. They will never put down a healthy dog. They are spotlessly clean, no bad smells, no misbehaving dogs. Every dog or cat that enters that place is well looked after, is loved, is treated like the angels they are, and they are found a good home. The work they do is incredible, and it appalls me to know that that's not the case everywhere. It's really, really sad. 
Anyway, the rest of this chapter is mostly about, you know, life with dog and it's all right, quite cute. And then she ends the book with a chapter on self-care, which is all I think pretty much fair enough. I think I kind of started to get bored at this point. So I just started skim reading, but it seemed fine. What I did kind of like about the book was that Lisa seemed to end every one of her chapters with a, yeah, and this is how I kind of learned to be okay and single and not have kids and marriage isn't probably for me. And yeah, I'm probably getting older. So kids aren't really my thing. My dog is good enough, all this sort of thing. And yeah, seemed cool. I liked that. I could relate to that. And I was like, nice. I like that she's putting this message out there. She's saying, you know, no stress. You're not doing things the traditional way. All good. And then all this work that she's done throughout the entire book, all these messages that she's put out there, she just completely undoes it all in the epilogue. Completely. Every message she had in this book, every moral, every lesson, she just undoes. She wrote this epilogue a year after the rest of the book, but just before it was published. And she says, just last year, I was convinced I wasn't destined for a wedding or kids. And I rebelled with booze and casual dating. 365 plus days later, I'm Googling wedding rings and even having moments where I think a baby would be kind of awesome, exploding poops and all. What the actual fuck? Who am I? How did this happen? And what in the world will next year look like at this rate? And it just kind of disappointed me. After reading this book, I'm thinking the same thing too. Wait, actually, who are you? This epilogue undoes the few good points you've made in this book. And it's disappointing because you're just perpetuating the stereotype of, well, all women do want marriage and kids. They all change their mind eventually. They just have to reach the right age. They just have to find the right man. And it annoys the hell out of me. I feel like you're doing a bit of a disservice to women by having such a drastic shift at the end of your book, undoing all the things you said and did, and it, uh, it just makes me uncomfortable and it annoyed me quite a bit. So there we go. Um, and that's the end of the book and that's the end of the video. That's where I'm gonna end this, but please let me know your thoughts um, down in the comments. Like I say, don't forget to go follow me on social media if you would like to. Uh, feel free to support my work over on Patreon if you want. You can also get exclusive stickers and prints and stuff over there. I have art prints and photography prints available over on my website. My book, Reflections on Healing, is a poetry and photography book available on Amazon now. And I think I'm pretty much done. I've rambled quite a bit. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you guys a lot. And I'll see you again very, very soon.